Hey guys, welcome to another episode of D&D 20. Um, just looking through all my notes, it's surprising how much we actually have already been through. So, I said earlier that it might be three episodes to catch you guys up. It might be like five. But we last left our adventurers uh, waking up to a strange mark on their hand after having a pretty weird dream. So as they have already woken up and the city is just waking up, our party looks for answers. So they naturally head over to Sandoval, the wizard, uh, hoping that they can figure out what this is. If it's magical, if it's something that they need to be worried about, something. They don't get answers. He knows very little. He goes based on what the symbol is, an eye, something is looking, something is seeing. Uh, they find no answers. Uh, the party splits up. Sai heads over to the elven slash half elven community deeper in Brenziri near near a lake uh Lorivir head and Ty Leaf head over to uh the their deities their special deities uh, and they break apart trying to find out answers as night falls the party reconvenes and they group together and come into a collective knowledge that this is a symbol of Nethys. He is the god of dreams and stars. He is a neut neutral god. So he is neither evil nor good. He's but he is not worshipped openly. He's not a god that is wild wildly accepted. As we head back to the inn, just then, we are confronted by a group of people. There's a lady bantering with the leader of this group of men about the will of Nethys. They had heard about our search, trying to find information about this. And they approach us. The fight ensues. Uh, the man claiming that Nethys had no need of us. The woman, quite different, saying that we had use. As his comrades fall down, the leader stands alone. And as Sai and Tyleve are about to charge him, the woman who has been standing back this entire fight kills him. She stands there with a smoking pistol. She introduces herself as Kanna and she remarks that she believes Nethys still has use for us and that he will work through us. We try to get information from her about the matter, about what Nethys, Nethys' will is, what he wants from us, and she's very vague. She says it is all Nethys' will, and we actually have no choice. Everything that happens is because he wants it to, which just infuriates anyone. It would just infuriate anyone that, excuse me, I have no control. But with that, she puts her pistols away in her bag of holding, conveniently located in her breast, and disappears. This is all a lot for us to take as a, as a party. So we go back to the inn, and the next day are escorted to the royal palace by Sir Edmund were brought in through rooms and rooms of dignitaries and 
politicians, and finally, at a waiting room, we are stripped of all our weapons and are brought before the throne room. Now, pleasantries are, are met, and we start asking the king about their orc problem. Uh, we are told that the orcs have recently gotten bolder, attacking the bigger cities. These nomadic ord tribes that would normally not deal with Bren Series patrols have started openly attacking cities. And there is an orc, a half orc, by the name of Kurgal that the kingdom knows and is causing a lot of trouble. He has started to unify the nations, well, or the nomadic tribes, under one banner, which is never a good thing. These, these clans that would fight against each other, keeping, I guess, the orc population down, have slowly become banded and more militarized. So, the king asked for our aid. Apparently, scouts have reported that an orc, there's a large orc encampment some north in some ruins. And scouts report that they are looking for something. The king does not know what, but whatever the orcs are looking for, he says, we cannot let them have it. He is to charge Sir Edmund with 200 of Redland Cavaliers to draw the orc out of, out of their encampment and for our party to sneak in, find what they're looking for, and take it. He says with this, he would give us a boon, a reward for our contribution. Everyone but Sai ask for something. Fast forward to the runes. And we are there. Sir Edmund leads his cavalry and draws the orc encampment out. The majority of the orc encampment out. We sneak inside the runes and after dispatching an orc party, a small orc party, who is indeed looking for something. We find a secret door in the walls that lead into a dungeon. After descending into the dungeon and ex start exploring, we notice that the walls on the right hand side are m muraled with death and destruction and just overall negative pictures and depictions while the left hand side of the wall depicts clerics healing and just generally good acts we come to across a statue after exploring everything is a dead end we come to the statue and the statue is split in half Half of it lifelike, almost alive with the detail. And the other half distorted, almost grotesque looking. And after applying healing to the grotesque side and destruction destruction fire on on the good side, it parts and reveals a doorway in which we enter the second part of the dungeon. We enter a cavern, large expansive cavern, and head deeper inside. And we get into this room with a door that is enchanted 
enchanted and sealed basically shut there is a portrait well actually not portrait it's it's more of an inscription in the room just before it that says you stand in the vault of ashes turn back now for while you may find what you seek you will not find what you want there is no hand in which the eye is safe. This unnerves and yet piques curiosity in the party as Mocha tries to work the, the runes and magic on this door. He starts to unweave the magic spell that has held this door shut. And as he does, he, he breaks it dispels that magic quite an accomplishment for a, a new sorcerer and the doors open there is but a single light source in this room a square room with a border a catwalk border all around and stairs leading up to a elevated pedestal with water surrounding it Lorvir, Sai, and Ty Leaves Wolf scout ahead. They circle the room once, find nothing of interest. At the very back of the room, they find a bunch of. It almost looks like a like a workshop, a, like a, a wizard's workshop. The party decides to then walk up towards this pedestal where the only light source of the room is and it's emanating from this orb uh, it's think of it like a like a snow globe but instead on the inside instead of that snow that nice pretty snow ashes are are swirling around as soon as we enter or come up into the platform. It is surrounded by four statues on the corner, each facing the statue with outstretched hands. Two of them are very lifelike, very real, almost as if they could just walk about and move. And the other two, almost mummified, again, that grotesque, almost deformed look. Sai notices from the corner of his eye, thank you, thanks for a, thanks to a perception check, that he could sworn one of the statues, one of the grotesque statues, moved. The party then assumes that this is what the orcs were looking for, this orb. So Sai takes out and touches it. We'll stop it from there. So, we're almost halfway there, guys. So, bear with me. There is a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm stopping because if I, I go, I'm just going to keep on going. And we'll pick it up in the next video. Stay tuned.